Hello, everybody. Happy Monday. Welcome to the show. Today, we have an interesting subject matter that we're going to be covering. Y'all know I didn't go to college, or at least when I did, I dropped out. <laughs> but we're re-entering the university conversation to talk about all the drama that is unfolding at Harvard and universities alike. But before we get into that, Taylor is in Nashville. <laughs> Hey, I saw somebody say, did you free Taylor? Yes, I am free. I was <laughs> at a wedding on Friday. I missed you guys, but glad to be back. Got my little Charlie Brown Christmas tree up, so we're feeling good and Aww. ready for a new week. You were very missed, Taylor. Everybody was in the comments trying to talk to you, asking you questions in the super chat, and you were nowhere to be found. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to pay you guys back for, for your time and the time that you missed of Taylor on this show. Now, let's get into the Harvard University drama. Now, I thought Harvard was dead long ago and most recently when I saw this headline that Harvard University was going to be offering a course called Taylor Swift and Her World, I thought surely this is the death of academia and higher education because be so real right now, why are there classes about Taylor Swift in, in college? But no, that's not the reason that we're having this conversation now. Who's under fire in this whole situation is the president of Harvard University, and she goes by the name of Claudine Gay. Now, I had heard her name before, and we'll get into exactly why, because she you know, was, was an accomplice in committing one of the most heinous acts of academic murder that we've seen on university campuses at Harvard, but we'll get to that true crime story in, uh, in a minute. So we're going to talk about how this all started. There are a number of different players in this game, a number of different layers to why Harvard is receiving so much backlash, so much blowback from comments that have been made and from things that have been discovered. But for now, we're going to focus on the president of the university, Claudine Gay. Now, Claudine Gay is a black woman. And the reason I make that apparent to you is because her entire platform is talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And most recently, she's been under fire because of what's been happening in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine. We all know that on the campus of Harvard, tons of students started to gather and protest, mostly in the name of Palestinians. They were chanting things like from uh, the river to the sea and gathering to really show their support for the Palestinian people. Now, many of these students were peaceful protesters who were just stating, you know what, we don't stand by the Israeli government and their actions right now. Others were maybe uh, more violent in their rhetoric and language. Others were supporting Hamas, saying that Hamas were, in fact, freedom fighters, and uh, there were students that were also calling for, for further genocide, presumably. So she's really under fire for what they've deemed to be a mishandling of the situation, of what's happening on campuses. She's not the only university president that is receiving backlash. It was a, a nationwide thing, as I'm sure we are all aware. But she was brought forward to have a, a hearing where she was questioned by members of Congress on her personal rhetoric, how she feels about students that they deem to be inciting violence or supporting genocide on the campus. And almost universally, people have said that she did not handle this hearing very well. I'm going to show you a clip of her uh, going back and forth with Elise Stefanik about these actions on college campuses, the rise of anti-Semitism on college campuses. And I'll let you hear her defense, which is interestingly coming from the, the virtue uh, of, of upholding free speech. And we'll get to why that is interesting and maybe false in just a bit. Is not protected free speech at Harvard, correct? Our commitment to it's free speech. It's a yes speech. or no question. Is that corrected? Is that okay for students to call for the mass murder of African Americans at Harvard? Is that protected free speech? Our commitment to free it's speech. It's a yes extends. or no question. Let me ask you this. You are president of Harvard, so I assume you're familiar with the term intifada, correct? I've heard that term, yes. And you understand that the use of the term intifada in the context of the Israeli-Arab conflict is indeed a call for violent armed resistance against the state of Israel, including violence against civilians and the genocide of Jews. Are you aware of that? That type of hateful speech is personally abhorrent to me. 
And there have been multiple marches at Harvard with students chanting, quote, there is only one solution, Intifada revolution, and quote, globalize the Intifada. Is that correct? I've heard that thoughtless, reckless, and hateful language on our campus, yes. So based upon your testimony, you understand that this call for Intifada is to commit genocide against the Jewish people in Israel and globally, correct? I will say again, that type of hateful speech is personally abhorrent to me. Do you believe that type of hateful speech is contrary to Harvard's code of conduct, or is it allowed at Harvard? It is at odds with the values of Harvard. Can you but not say here that it is against the code of conduct at Harvard? We embrace a commitment to free expression, even of views that are objectionable, offensive, hateful. It's when that speech crosses into conduct that violates our policies against bullying, harassment, Does that speech and not cross that barrier? Does Okay, so you get the gist here of essentially what's what's happening. She's going back and forth, trying to justify the fact that, you know, she's allowing students to say this on campus. And we're going to get into an interesting discussion here because there is a lot to be justified in what she's saying. And we will draw the line and, you know, give you guys the distinction between speech that is is covered and protected under free speech and speech that isn't. Before that, I believe we got a $50 super chat, which means we have to read those immediately. Taylor, do you have that pulled I up? I do. And that's from our buddy, Alex, aka RP Awareness Month, he says, and this is a bit of a left turn from the, the narrative that we're building, <laughs> okay. but it's fine. We'll take a little intermission. Uh, hey guys, I missed most of Friday's show. I wasn't calling that trad girl a gold digger because she's 100% right. I suggested the gold digger soundbite because of Fresh and Fit. Speaking of Fresh gotcha. and Fit, no Taylor's fan club. That's not what Fresh and Fit preaches at all. By the way, Taylor has bad pickup lines. <laughs> Taylor has bad pickup lines. <laughs> Wait, where did, I don't even remember where that conversation came up. I do remember the gold digger. And yes, I agree with you. That woman was not a gold digger. She was totally right in those uh, text messages that we read on Friday's show. And you guys can check that out if you're curious as to the subject matter that we're talking about. But I'm glad that you agree. Alex. Now, okay, let's 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 draw the distinction here and we'll get back to what we were talking about when it comes to free speech and free speech being protected on college campuses. If you are a college student who is witnessing what's happening right now in the Middle East and you decide, I feel like I am more pro-Palestinian in this conflict that I don't agree with what the Israeli government is doing, it should be perfectly fine for you to espouse that on your college campus. It should be perfectly fine for you to say, I don't agree with what's going on right now and all all of that would be protected under free speech. But if you're moving to statements that are inciting violence, calling for the genocide of a certain group of people, that is not necessarily protected and would be against the code of conduct of a university like Harvard. So it's very important that we draw that distinction. I feel like many are saying all of the students present at the protest are violating the code of conduct, and I don't believe that to be true. You would have to find direct instances and individual instances of the students who are actually calling for the genocide of Jewish people, which is just insane to say that on this show right now. But you'd have to actually find instances of students saying that, and they should be reprimanded as you know this situation is investigated. The very same thing should happen for students that are calling for the genocide of Palestinians. I want to make that very clear. But if you are a student who says, I support the Israeli government, that is protected under free speech. And this is all with knowing that when you sign up to go to a university or a college, what you are signing up for or should be signing up for is your views being challenged. As always, universities you know, are, are meant to keep you safe physically right, but you're supposed to have your beliefs challenged. You are, yes, going to be uh, offended at some point or another if you are particularly sensitive to certain lines of speech or certain subject matters being talked about. And the very purpose of higher education is so that you can contend with d different ideas and go back and forth and have yourself challenged. So I can defend Claudine Gay in that it seems that all of a sudden she cares about free speech, but we are gonna talk about her history on the campus that is Harvard University, where she has by no means upheld this sentiment of wanting free speech to be uh, upheld you know, through, throughout the university and on campus. And just to give you a little bit of background here, 
these campuses get scores as to how well they uphold free speech uh, on on the campus. They go and survey students about this very topic and get feedback from them. I'm going to read you a little bit of the feedback about Harvard University most recently. So the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression is responsible, as well as College Pulse, and they release an annual ranking on these uh, campus free speech scores. Harvard is ranked at the lowest score possible, a fat zero. A fat, fat zero is what Harvard gets uh, as a university when it comes to free speech. And I'll give you some more clear numbers here as the students were surveyed on this. It says more than half, 53% of students reported self-censoring on campus at least once or twice a month. And 58% said they worried that being misunderstood could lead to reputational damage. So it doesn't seem like the general culture at Harvard is one of of free speech. And Claudine Gay has messed up in that respect. She's messed up in many others, which we will also detail for you. But it seems like now that she's actually receiving backlash, as this is an issue that we've deemed cannot be ignored, she suddenly cares about the free speech of college students. Now, all this to say... She should have kept that same energy. She should have kept that same sentiment all throughout her professional career at Harvard. And the fact that she didn't, most notably toward, you know, white campus members who are constantly being, you know, called racist and thrown different slurs at them and all this stuff. We've all seen this change on college campuses recently, where if you're going to be racist or derogatory, just make sure that it's pointed towards white people and you will be a okay for, for doing that. So where was that energy uh, of, you know, talking about free speech and and protecting students and all this all this other stuff when this was all this was all happening and you know she wouldn't feel the same if if a white student said something about slavery or said something racist to to a black student said something derogatory towards them that would not be that would not be protected you would be out of the campus you would be expelled from the campus if they had any sort of knowledge that this was happening probably even an allegation could get you, uh, you know, reprimanded on this campus. So where was that energy when these things were happening on Harvard, which we all know it was, but suddenly now that she's the one receiving the backlash, she cares about free speech. Yeah, it's really convenient to start wielding the Constitution whenever your speech is being called into question and whenever your policies are being uh, criticized. Now you get to use that as a shield against the criticism that you're receiving when all, uh, all throughout your tenure mm -hmm. as first as a, a dean of DEI or whatever, and when you were establishing that that whole uh reign of terror for uh, the diversity, actually inclusion in hiring and then the discriminat discriminatory uh, admissions practices. And when Harvard is not wanting to let these conservative speakers come to campus and speak freely, right. uh, when a Republican wants to maybe be a professor, we we know the statistics on how many Republicans and Democrats are uh, donors are uh, on faculty and universities like this. And it's just very rich to all of a sudden care about the principles in the Constitution of equality and free speech and use that as a shield when you've been blowing right past those uh, throughout the duration of your tenure and using them, at, at, well, not using them at, right. when, while you're instituting this whole uh, this whole new regime that is completely oriented toward advancing a leftist political orthodoxy and a leftist political agenda at the expense of the university's excellence and at the expense of the equality and fair uh, opportunities for certain students, certain professors, and certain people. So it's just uh, completely ironic. Yeah, you know what should have happened in the wake of all this, which, yes, is a is a, you know, massive conflict that I'm sure many have very strong opinions about. Harvard should have platformed discussions between students to actually go back and forth and talk about what's happening and do so in a healthy way. Instead, it, they let everything get out of hand. And now, you know, now we're, we're dealing with this. And again, students should be able to protest. Students should be able to have these conversations so long as they are not inciting violence, harassing others and, you uh, you know, conducting themselves in a way that is physically violent towards other students. These things should be allowed. But when you don't carry that sentiment all throughout your work on the campus, it starts to look like 
you're a little bit of a hypocrite, right? For, for the things that you're doing and the things that you're suddenly saying now that you are able to defend yourself. And I have so many other qualms with Harvard. Harvard has, you know, segregated graduations that you can, you know, attend as a student for black students, for Asian students. And, you know, we don't, we won't do that for our white counterparts. They've, been called into question over their affirmative action. And this was taken to, you know, the highest court in in our land, the Supreme Court, where they they lost that case as well because they were discriminating against white and Asian students. They also have race based dorms at, at Harvard. So Claudine Gay has not done anything great for this institution. In fact, I feel like she's tainted the, the reputation of Harvard beyond repair. I don't know anybody who is currently taking higher education all that seriously unless they absolutely have to attend a, a university or go to college. Well, and that's what's so ironic about this is that she's actually right in what she's appealing to. Yes. Uh, but the problem is she doesn't actually believe it. And she deserves to be removed from her position because the way that she's been governing has been inconsistent with constitutional principles, inconsistent with the principles of free speech and equality and things like that. That's why she's unqualified for this job. She happens to be appealing to the right argument right. in her her own defense at, in this hearing. And it's kind of ironic that she's taking a lot of heat for her performance in the hearing, which she's not technically saying anything uh, wrong uh, mm -hmm. when it comes down to the principles of the matter. The problem is she doesn't actually live by those principles. Yeah. And that's what we all should be emphasizing and in talking about rather than saying that she needs to crack down on hate speech on uh, Harvard University which we all know how I feel about about hate speech. If you are not inciting violence or calling for violence against another student, your speech is allowed. Yes, it may offend. Yes, you know, it might be abrasive to a certain group of people, but it's allowed. Offensive speech and speech that we've deemed to be hateful is protected under free speech. And I can't think of a more important place to have that protection set in place than uh, elite universities. Now, before we get into CNN changing their tune on, you know, Harvard universities and just universities at large and higher education, which we will get to because it's just insane to watch it unfold and to hear CNN say something that, yes, we've been saying for a long time, but at least they are admitting it. I want to just lay some groundwork on Claudine Gay and how she has not upheld these principles throughout her tenure at Harvard University. I remember reading the story and saying, Claudine Gay, Claudine Gay, that sounds awfully familiar. And I remember hearing a story about something that she did to an economist by the name of Roland Fryer. Now, a lot of you may not recognize this guy's name, but here he is. This, this guy's uh, name is Roland Fryer. He is a very, very well-known economist, and he has a very interesting story, which we will detail. And this is the academic murder that I was referring to that Cla Claudine Gay was most definitely an accomplice in. I'll give you some background on Roland Fryer. So Roland Fryer was born in Daytona Beach, not too far away from where I lived in Florida, and was abandoned by his mother. Wouldn't go on to meet that woman until he was, I think, 20 years old. His father was a, a raging alcoholic, believe was committing crimes. Throughout his young adulthood, he was going and shoplifting and, and stealing. He was carrying guns around. He did not have uh, the best upbringing, and things were not looking good for Roland Fryer. But he ends up getting an academic scholarship to uh, a university. And through that academic scholarship, he is introduced to an economics class. As he you know, passes through the class, he decides, I'm really interested in economics. I'm going to pursue this further. And he starts his journey of becoming an economist. And in his time as an economist, he's very similar to the, uh, the Glenn Lowry's of the world, the... Uh, the Thomas Souls of the world. And when you read into some of his work, you will find that it's very similar. Most notably, he did a, a whole journal about this idea of acting white. And Roland Fryer was challenging a lot of the ideas and preconceptions that we had towards blackness in America. We all thought, oh, black people are uh, oppressed. It's because of systemic racism. It's because of white supremacy. It's because of this nation's history. And Roland Fryer decided to do a study about why black kids were not performing well enough in school. He really set his sights on education because he saw that this was a really important issue for black America and that black American students were not meeting the same academic standards as white students. 
So he goes on this journey to decide and to figure out what is the problem here? What is happening to black American students? And he did this study where he went around to different schools and started investigating how popular the, the students were. And he would do so by doing a survey of the students and asking them, who are your, your three best friends? And each student had an answer for three best friends. And this is how he gauged popularity. The most popular kids at the school would be listed as a best friend more so than any other. Now, he compared the best friend answers with the grades of the students in school. And what he found in this research was that if you were a black student, as your grades got better and better and better, you went from D to C to B to A, there was a sudden drop off in your popularity. And he found out that this was because black students associated doing well in school with acting white. And the more white you acted, the less popular you would be among your peers. So this was a bombshell paper in that he found that it might not be discrimination and racism that was holding black students back. It could be a cultural issue and a cultural view towards doing well in academia. So he publishes this paper in 2005. And of course, nobody is excited to hear this paper, especially those who are cheering on diversity, equity and inclusion and this whole narrative of black oppression and white supremacy. But from that, he he moves on, he continues to work, and he becomes the first African-American to ever win what's called the Clark Medal, which is for young economists and, and bright, promising young economists. Then a couple years later, he becomes a professor at none other than Harvard University. Now, the people who are working alongside him in different departments at Harvard University is uh, one one's name is Larry Bobo. And we'll, we'll get to him. His name appears a few times throughout this story. But the others is Claudine Gay, okay? So Claudine Gay, this woman who I have such beef with over this story, is working <laughs> at Harvard University alongside Roland Fryer. And her whole initiative is this inequality initiative where she's pushing, yes, diversity, equity, and inclusion. She believes in black victimhood. She believes that white supremacy is one of the biggest issues facing this nation and that we need to even the plan field through not equality, but equity. Okay. So this is what she's working on. And of course she does not like Roland Fryer because every bit of research that Roland Fryer doing is doing is flying in the face of her greatest theories about white supremacy and just inequality and inequity. And the same goes for Larry Bobo. Larry Bobo and Claudine Gay are like besties in their, <laughs> in their academic research because all they do is cry about racism, 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 okay? So Roland Fryer's chilling at Harvard. He's doing all these studies. He starts investigating police brutality. And he and his research team start going through all the different instances and cases of police brutality, all the black people that have lost their lives at the hands of police officers. And what do they find? This shocking revelation that they could not prove that there was bias active in these instances of police brutality, that police were not, in fact, discriminating purposefully against African-Americans and black Americans. And again, they published this paper. Who's freaking out? All the leftist academics who are, you know, in all these different universities, Larry Bobo, Claudine Gay, they hate his ass. They don't want to hear anything he has to say, any of the research that's coming out of his lab. And then I feel like this plot starts, right? And obviously I'm just speculating here. But on the heels of this discovery that Roland Fryer puts out to, to the public and to, you know, the, the sphere of higher academia, a an assistant starts making accusations against him. And of course, like they do with a lot of great men, not all of them, right, but those who challenge the system, sexual assault allegations start to rise against Roland Fryer from this one woman in particular. And she says, you know, I've worked with Roland Fryer. He is, you know, sexually flirtatious. She brings about this whole, you know, allegation against him. And come to find out, that many of these allegations don't stick. This woman was actually meant to be fired, right? And they offer her a payment. The university goes, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna pay you. We'll get rid of you. Bye bestie, you know, head out on your way. And she was supposed to get $25,000 more than what she actually was, was given by the university. 
but they cut it by twenty five thousand dollars. So it seems as though this woman has a personal vendetta against Roland Fryer. So she comes out with these with these allegations and the plot thickens. OK, 38 allegations are listed uh, from this personal assistant against Roland Fryer. She said these are 38 instances of this man coming at me in a sexual way, being inappropriate. And yes, there were flirtatious messages between Roland Fryer and this woman. She would send pictures to him of her at, at work parties. They would flirt here and there about how, you know, he wants to move to this country and would she come with him and all this different stuff. By no means was it professional conduct. But Never in all of these allegations did Roland Fryer come on to this woman sexually or sexually provoke her in any way. So the 38 claims are, are laid out. Six of them are immediately thrown out and they say these are baseless. There's, there's nothing here. We cannot come after him on that. Then the university starts an investigation against Roland Fryer. So we're down to 32 different claims in this paper. Another 26 are thrown out in the investigation. Many of them they deem to be just outright fabrications that were created uh, from this woman against Roland Fryer, which means six are left behind. And these six are not actual sexual assault allegations. They're not any, uh, you know, any instances where he has sexually provoked her in any way. It's just that he was unprofessional. OK, so. They go through this whole investigation and they say, OK, well, well, six of these things have, have stuck. Another woman who used to work with Roland Fryer says that he's he's flirted with her and they deem that to be inappropriate. So they say we must bring punishment against Roland Fryer. Now, luckily, he was tenured at Harvard University, which means you can't technically fire him. That's just like a special status that you get on university campuses where once you have it, you have that for for life. You technically have a job at the university for life. So they permanently close his lab that was doing all of this research and investigation into police brutality and other race based issues, working uh, with kids and education and all of the, the different clients and, and black students that he had helped. They suspend all the different projects that his research team was working on. And Miss Claudine Gay, Claudine Gay, she raises her hand. She's like, can I get a special instance where we actually remove tenure from this guy? Because I don't ever want to see him at Harvard University again. Now, luckily, they had principals at the university at the time. And they said, there's no way, never in our history have we removed you know, tenure from, from a professor like this. He's going to keep his tenure. But this woman tried to come after this man. And not because she had anything to really lean on or support herself in the allegations that were laid against him, but simply because his ideology was dissident to hers and that she could not stand that this man in all of his research was like flying in the face of her theories about racism and white supremacy in black America. And when you look back at the life of Claudine Gay, right? Roland Fryer, we, we mentioned, Mother left him when he was a child, didn't get to meet her until he was 20. His father was an alcoholic and a criminal. He ended up being a criminal for much of his young adult life. Claudine Gay was raised by an engineer. So this is like some silver spoon kid, a silver spoon black kid who goes to all these different universities, makes it into Harvard, eventually becomes the dean and now the president. And she is the one who is hell bent on proving this theory of black victimhood in America. So my girl murdered Roland Fryer academically <laughs> at this campus and simply because she didn't like what he had to say. And she's done similar things. Taylor was looking up, you know, her some of her record and the name Ronald Sullivan popped up. And you said that he she was fired or she fired him simply because he decided to defend Harvey Weinstein. Yes. Uh, this is the quote that I have it says as Dean, when uh Gay was dean. She showed no respect for basic American legal principles when she fired Harvard Law School professor Ronald Sullivan as residential dean for taking on the legal defense of Harvey Weinstein. So again, this is an instance of it's one thing to find something distasteful like certain chance or someone she's choosing to a lawyer choosing to defend someone that you have a huge moral problem with. But it's another thing to abandon first principles in order to coerce them or use force against them in some way to get them removed or like she did with Roland uh, Fryer and yeah. apparently this guy, Ronald Sullivan. So she, this girl has a long history 
of just starting beef with people who she disagrees with and trying to ruin their careers. And it's probably because she is so subscribed to this idea of her own victimhood that she really sees herself as like the freedom fighter at any moment, at any given time when she's doing these things, which she's actively fighting against free speech. Now, she's able to hide it under the guise of, oh, look, he was defending Harvey Weinstein, which we all know how I feel about Harvey Weinstein. He sounds like an absolute POS, okay? But does he get defended in the court of law? Of course, that's part of due process. So if somebody decides to take that on and it happens to be a professor at Harvard University, they should be able to keep their job in taking on a, a client like that, okay? So that's a separate, a whole, a whole entirely separate issue. The same thing with Roland Fryer, you're upset at his speech, so then you launch this entire attack in an in, in effort to get his tenure removed because you can't handle your ideas being challenged. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, when the students are protesting in the name of, of Palestine and, and all of this is happening on your campus and you're brought in front of the, this House Committee on Education, suddenly you care about free speech. Just give me a break. Give me a break. Yeah, there's always some sort of pretense, right? It's, oh, it's it's to be against systemic racism. It's because of me too. It's sexual assault. It's whatever. But ultimately, deep down, you have a rigid ideology that is fundamentally weak. It doesn't work in the real world as evidenced by the people who are doing real research that is refuting the central claims and narratives uh, that you espouse. And you come up with some pretense to make yourself look, you know, pure as the driven snow as you're going after them and doing the ugliest things imaginable, lying about them, committing censorship and violating people's free speech, discriminating actively against people on the basis of their race, but always because of this, this pretense of, of goodness. And again, this is why she's not qualified for this job. She's demonstrated that and throughout her career, as you're laying out this commitment to ideology above principle, to discrimination over equality. Um, and she's simply not the type of person who should be in a position where she's responsible to uphold uh, the good name and the standard of excellence that's been established at America's most prestigious university. And this, she's not, she's one example. We know this as this uh, ideology and the, uh, the institutional capture has metastasized to all kinds of universities around the country. It's almost more the norm now for universities to be run and also social media platforms and big tech companies and, uh, you know, Hollywood studios, et cetera, to be controlled by a small group of people who are very activist in their ideology, very aggressive, and very willing to use force to stamp out people that they disagree with, to step over them, to silence them, to get them removed. And this is all being exposed. So my hope with this story is that it's not just one, you know, one isolated thing, um, but that this is beginning to show and where we're seeing more and more cracks in the, the chokehold that the DEI types have had over our institutions for the past several years. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's time that we like we really pull the rug out from under these people and start to expose them in more ways than one. It's one thing to suddenly be talking about free speech when you haven't, you know, been an example of that throughout your entire career. It's another thing to, you know, uh, instate these rules of affirmative action on campus. It's another thing to segregate graduations. It's another thing to segregate dorm rooms. And mind you, like, there is so much money being funneled into a university like Harvard. When you think about these elite institutions, they have something called uh, an endowment, which is just like the money that they have uh, for their, their fiscal year or whatever. The endowment of Harvard is, guys, I, I kid you not, $50.9 billion. $50.9 billion funneled into this university. For what? So that they can get a diversity, equity, and inclusion education that features a course on, like, Taylor Swift, and they can mm -hmm. censor free speech and not allow students to actively say what they feel. If you have a $50.9 billion endowment and... 53% of your students don't even feel comfortable espousing their opinions, something wrong is happening, and you don't deserve 
to be where you're at. Now, Claudine Gay is tenured, much like Roland Fryer is at, at, at Harvard. So it's not that she can actually be, you know, fired unless they deem this to be a, a special instance where they are willing to go that far. It would just be that she's removed from her, her presidential status at the university, which seems deserved at this point. It does seem deserved. Now, uh, oh, real quick, yeah. one other thought on this that I've seen some of you guys in the chat and we saw uh, the, the headline uh, that over 500 or something to the tune of 500 faculty at Harvard uh, signed a letter in support of Claudine. But yes. I saw an interesting thing about that is that the S500 faculty signed that. That sounds like a big number, but Harvard has something like 2,400 plus professors. So when you do the math on that, it's like, what, 75, 80 percent of them do. Uh, did not sign the letter in support of her, which to me speaks to this idea that there's a relatively small group of people uh, that are very radical in their ideas who do occupy a lot of these positions. And you're talking about the the size of the endowment. That's just faculty. You also yeah. have the bureaucracy. And we know that in a lot of uh, domains like in healthcare and in academia alike, uh, we've seen the amount of uh non-teaching sort of roles, non-medical specific roles, but very administrative roles, those have skyrocketed in, in recent years. And I can't help but imagine that a lot of these hires that are administrative hires, that's all the diversity people are for the most part is going to be those types of hires. And I wonder how much of that endowment is just, you know, part of this whole bloated infrastructure that's been being built at Harvard uh, over the last couple of decades. Yeah, I mean, we know that the universities are, they're scam artists in a lot of different ways, right? Not not just in the, the tuition that they're taking from students in order to give them these BS degrees, but also, you know, how much of that endowment is funded by people who have special interest in what happens on, on the university campus? How much of that endowment is enjoyed by somebody like Claudine Gay? We went through the whole scandal of, you know, all these celebrities and rich parents being out for having paid for their students to get into uh, institutions like that of Harvard. So, you know, where's the money moving around? How is this working? And I, I wonder if those same faculty who signed that letter are going to support her after this other bit of news that we've gotten that I see many of you also discussing in the chat down below. Claudine Gay was recently outed by Christopher Rufo for having plagiarized her, her thesis that would end up getting her her PhD. So uh, I'll bring up the tweets here so that you can see exactly what he's found. Uh, so it says exclusive. Real Chris Brunet and I have obtained documentation demonstrating that Harvard President Claudine Gay plagiarized multiple sections of her PhD thesis, violating Harvard's policies on academic integrity. This is a bombshell. Now, if you go through here, he has several instances where, which range from minor to major, but all in violation of uh, Harvard's policies, where she directly takes sentences and paragraphs from other people's work in uh, reference for her PhD thesis. And interestingly enough, uh, th this very first example is her taking multiple sentences directly from the work that of Larry Bobo, her little partner in crime in the academic murder of Roland Fryer. So it's interesting to watch this all play out. But as we scroll through here, it's just example after example after example. She even, uh, you know, copied what seems to be an entire appendix for her PhD thesis from the person responsible for reviewing her, her PhD thesis. So somehow uh, and in some way, this flew under the radar and Claudine Gay got out of this unscathed and, you know, sits as the president of Harvard University now. We shall see what happens. But at the very least, it seems like she needs to be knocked a few tiers down from where she stands now. Yeah, it's one thing, you know, as any average college student will say, you know, it's one thing to be a little bit liberal with the copy and paste when you're doing some papers and right. maybe not putting quotes everywhere you should or using too much text from somebody like that. But when you're the president of Harvard, which again is supposed to be the most prestigious academic institution in the entire country, some might say the world, uh, then we have a little bit of a problem. You should be an example of the standard that you are presiding over that presumably you are there to establish. So this is just yet another uh, really not a good look 
for Claudine in this case. Yeah, so hopefully she's held accountable on that front. Now, speaking of accountability, <laughs> let's listen to this CNN segment uh, where they suddenly talk about what seems to be the downfall of the American university. Now, mind you, we all are familiar with CNN. We've, we've seen uh, much of their coverage. We know whose side they stand on on most issues. But it seems like at a certain point, and we've seen this happen with, you know, all the different things that we've, you know, brought out the bullhorn about, have been trying to warn people about, that once it becomes a comfortable place, and once the general consensus among the public is that this is the thing to say, it becomes the thing that CNN says, right? So as as conservatives are saying it, or and we're raising the, the red flag saying, you know, universities are not looking too healthy right now, it seems like people are getting discouraged discriminated against. Uh, white students can't express themselves. Conservative students can't express themselves. There seems to be an issue on these campuses. It's silence. It's crickets. It's tomato, tomato, tomato. But now that the general consensus is Claudine Gay has handled the situation incorrectly, handled the, the hearing incorrectly, whether or not you, you believe that or not, CNN decides to air this. Here's my take. When one thinks of America's greatest strengths, the kind of assets the world looks at with admiration and envy. America's elite universities would long have been at the top of that list. But the American public has been losing faith in these universities for good reason. Three university presidents came under fire this week for their vague and indecisive answers when asked whether calling for the genocide of Jews would violate their institution's codes of conduct. But to understand their performance, we have to understand the broad shift that has taken place at elite universities, which have gone from being centers of excellence to institutions pushing political agendas. People sense the transformation. As Paul Tuff has pointed out, the share of young adults who said a college degree was very important fell from 74% in 2013 to just 41% in 2019. In 2018, 61% of those polls said higher education was headed in the wrong direction, and only 38% felt it was on the right track. In 2016, 70% of America's high school graduates were headed for college. Now that number is 62%. This souring on higher education makes America an outlier among all advanced nations. American universities have been neglecting a core focus on excellence in order to pursue a variety of agendas, many of them clustered around diversity and inclusion. It started with the best of intentions. Colleges wanted to make sure young people of all backgrounds had access to higher education and felt comfortable on campus. But those good intentions have morphed into a dogmatic ideology and turned these universities into places where the pervasive goals are political and social engineering, not academic merit. It's no wonder that nobody wants to go to college anymore uh, when, you know, the job market is, is shifting in itself and there's way more opportunity for those who have never received uh, a degree. But also, like, what degree are you receiving? <laughs> and for, for tens of thousands of dollars, if you're getting like this sort of like BS education, why would you go and, and pay that when you can find opportunities elsewhere? And and just a bit of pushback in, in that I understand what he's saying, that these things started with good intentions. Your intentions do not matter uh, in, in this case, right? It's, it's fine to have good intent in that we want to make a, you know, an, an equitable space for, uh, you know, all students. But the intent of creating an equitable space is an inherently harmful intent. And so many people have raised the flag and said, you should not be pushing for equity. You should be pushing for equality. And this is what equality looks like. It looks like taking uh, race out of out of applications, taking gender out of applications, allowing people to come forward as who they are without being judged on these just baseless characteristics. That's what equality looks like. But there, this intention of equality is, isn't even one of good intent. And even if it was, what matters is your outcome. Your intentions will get you so far and there's a lot to be said for intentions when it comes to things like free speech or what's deemed to be hate speech. But when it comes to education and these universities and their implementation of these ideas, the outcomes is truly what matters. And people have been raising the flag telling them about these horrible outcomes for I don't know how long, but it took this current conflict in order for people to realize that this has been an issue for a very long time. 
you know, what's that famous Milton Friedman quote? It's like, uh, you shouldn't judge policies by their intentions, but by their results. Yeah. And that's, this isn't a new revelation. This is something that we've known now for decades, maybe even centuries. Uh, and yet we're continuing to repeat the cycle and make mistakes that we really have no business making. You know, if your good intentions are driving you to violate the first principles that the country was founded on of ideas, again, like like equal opportunity, like equality, like free speech. If you're having to trample on the things that built the very thing that you're standing on now uh, in order to you know, establish this new utopia that you're driving us towards, then you're probably not smarter than our ancestors. And what you're doing is probably leading in the same direction that everyone else who tried to build something a utopian on those uh, while without those first principles, while not respecting them, uh, it's going to end up in the same same way. So this is why we need as a culture to have a firm grasp of who we are as a culture of what our principles are, and really just a deep appreciation for for our values. Because when you lose sight of those, you make the same mistakes that you really don't need to make. And that is what's so maddening about this whole thing is that we have seen that we have seen people who have been principled, you know, we've always talked about that, that clip of Dennis Prager on Bill Maher, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, saying from the get go that people are are identifying as as or saying that men can menstruate and saying that that's the direction of society's head, heading and he was laughed at. Uh, we've seen now like Barry Weiss came out also on Bill Maher and uh, talked about how she's done with COVID once it was safe to no longer uh, once it was safe to say so as a liberal. And, you know, I have no ill will toward liberals who are honestly dealing in facts as they emerge. Um, Scott Galloway was another example who said he regretted supporting uh, the tightening of COVID restrictions and extending the length of time that his child's school was was uh, closed. Yeah. But it's it's like we can't keep making these mistakes, guys. At some point, you have to take inventory of Hey, we tried this new idea. Hey, we tried uh, defund the police, and then we had to come out and say this was stupid. Uh, we tried uh, having this uh, this approach toward the homelessness policy in California, and we see that it destroyed our city. So maybe we don't need to do this anymore, and we should stick to better ideas and and first principles. Uh, but instead, it seems like we have to keep. Re figuring out ways to fail and wait until the damage has already been done. Wait until lives have already been destroyed. The economy has been destroyed. Wait until people's liberties have been trampled on until we actually start to say, oopsies, oops. Yeah. And that it's just such a, such a frustrating thing. So here we are again with Fareed Zakari on CNN saying, well, we guys, we got a breaking news. We got it wrong on the universities. Like, right. oh yeah, that's really breaking. We've all been shouting this for a decade now or decades even. Uh, it's just so frustrating when you have the right answer at the very beginning and all of this could be avoided if you were just a little bit wiser if you're just stuck to your principles if you just weren't so ideologically driven and instead we have to suffer the consequences of bad ideas instead of just learning from them and learning from prior generations uh, that have already been down those roads and learned uh, how to adapt and how and what principles to enshrine that prevent us from doing the wrong things that they keep doing. It's so crazy. there's my little rant. And it, like, and it is enshrined. It's like, if you look at the rules, <laughs> like under under the headline of free speech, you can just literally like look at the rules. You should have like, I don't a rubric that should tell you what, it, what people should and should not be able to say <laughs> or what should be punishable or, or what isn't. And it's just, it's very clear and distinct. I don't know like how we, we can't agree on this already or, or figure it out. And I have my theories on how we'll get into that uh, a little bit further into Fareed's take on the situation. As the evidence produced for the recent Supreme Court case on affirmative action showed, universities have systematically downplayed merit-based criteria for admissions in favor of racial quotas. Some universities' response to this ruling seems to be that they will go further down this path, eliminating the requirement for any standardized tests like the SAT. That move would allow them to then take students with little reference to objective criteria. Of course, those who would suffer most would be bright students from poor backgrounds who normally use tests like the SAT to demonstrate their qualifications. In the humanities, hiring for new academic positions now appears to center on the race and gender of the applicant, as well as the subject matter, which needs to be about marginalized groups. 
A white man studying the American presidency does not have a prayer of getting tenure at a major history department in America today. Grade inflation in the humanities is rampant. At Yale, the median grade is now an A. New subjects crop up that are really political agendas, not academic fields. You can now major in diversity, equity, and inclusion at some colleges. The ever-growing bureaucracy devoted to diversity, equity, and inclusion naturally recommends that more time and energy be spent on these issues. The most obvious lack of diversity at universities, political diversity, which clearly affects their ability to analyze many issues, is never addressed, showing that these goals are not centrally related to achieving or sustaining or building excellence. Out of this culture of diversity has grown the collection of ideas and practices that we have now all heard of. Safe spaces, trigger warnings, microaggressions. As the authors Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff have discussed, many of these colleges have instituted speech codes that make it a violation of university rules to say things that some groups might find offensive. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen. It's exactly how we got here. And it's amazing how swiftly we got here, where I would see some college campuses who never had a a DEI officer or administrator, and then all of a sudden a few years pass, and now every single university or college has like a DEI office where you can go and speak to an administrator if you feel like your your rights uh, to a safe space on campus have been violated. They have whole like uh, multicultural spaces, which what that really means is every single culture except for white people are able to be present in this room, and it's a safe space for all except for white students. And how quick Quickly, this this snowball effect started with diversity, equity, and inclusion being instated on campuses. And the reason we are having all these discussions about what students can and cannot say is this, is that they've deemed that there should be safe spaces where certain speech is limited or that there is such a thing as hate speech, which I vehemently disagree with. But here we are now, which is why, you know, Claudine Gay is being brought in front of this committee to talk about all the different protests that are happening on university campuses alongside other uh, presidents at their universities. And it all could have been avoided had we just clearly outlined and defined what free speech means. Somebody did that. Uh, they just chose to go, la, 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 me, 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 me. I'm going to cover my eyes, not listen to a word you're saying without having the wisdom to recognize that there is a real reason for having such profound discussions surrounding what free speech is and how we implement it. And it would be less maddening, right, if we if we could grant that, OK, maybe they just weren't aware of this. But when Claudine Gay is brought to account over her behavior, uh, she's able to cite the Constitution and say mm-hmm. that I understand where what these principles are. I understand that speech should be upheld. And and yet they just don't behave like it over and over again. So it's that's that's what's all the more maddening. And I, I did express frustration at Fareed, but I am very happy uh, uh, that he is able to articulate this. And he has articulated very powerfully. And I'm glad that he's using his platform to espouse what he has has now realized is right. the right way. And unlike, you know, I saw someone say something to the effect of, you know, Taylor's effectively saying, if you had just listened to the right or Republicans or whatever, then none of this would be here. Well, one, Mm-mm. maybe that's pretty true. I, I would still stand by that assessment. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that Republicans always get it right or that people on the right don't ever get dogmatic and rigid with their ideology. And what I've seen a lot of people who are also frustrated with Fareed coming out uh, saying that, oh, don't listen to him. Screw this guy. You know, we don't want to join hands with people like this. Why are people celebrating this? And I know I do celebrate Fareed coming out and saying all this, these true things, even if it is late. And I am perfectly willing to join hands with liberals who are committed now to liberal principles and wanting to rebuild a society that does revere things like free speech and equality. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to do that. I will still articulate my frustration and Mm -hmm. remind them that, hey, we were saying this uh, all along, um, but I don't want this situation and I don't really sympathize with the view that unless you were as ideologically pure as me all along and knew it from the get-go, then I want nothing to do with you and you don't deserve a seat at the table. Uh, I think, I don't think you can build a healthy society as much as you need good principles and a good moral vision for a healthy society. You also need a redemption you need forgiveness. You need a path to uh, coexist and collaborate and use speech to uh, find 
common ground and to negotiate and compromise. And those are things that you have to have in a pluralistic society. And so I don't think it's healthy when the right goes so far and says, well, if you didn't get it right all along, I'll never partner with you. No, right. I, I, that's that's too much. All I'm saying is we need to review these principles that would have prevented us from going down this route in the first place. But yes, now that we've learned the hard way, let's reaffirm our commitment to them, re-enshrine them, teach them in schools and uh institute them in all, of all, in all of our institutions and make those the basis of our judgments because we know those are tried and true. We know their work, their firm footing on uh, under which we can build something that, that lasts and that works for everybody. Yeah, you are always welcome in the free speech club when you get there and when you make the realization that, that, that there is a very important reason why we've decided that free speech is such an important thing in this country. You're always welcome to make that realization. I do hope it is coupled with a little bit of accountability for maybe what you've done to uh, to ruin that position in the past and to not stand by that position in the past, which is exactly what we're missing uh, in the case of CNN and in the case of Claudine Gay. A, su a sudden spark of, uh, you know, interest and passion for, for freedom of speech that is not coupled with any accountability for your prior stances on uh, on freedom of speech. So it's unfortunate, but also welcome to the club. And I'm glad we're seeing something like this on CNN. Universities advise students not to speak, act, even dress in ways that might cause offense to some minority groups. With this culture of virtue signaling growing, the George Floyd protests erupted and many universities latched on and issued statements effectively aligning their institutions with these protests. By my memory, few took such steps even after 9-11 or during the Iraq war. In this context, it is understandable that Jewish groups would wonder, why do safe spaces, microaggressions, and hate speech not apply to us? If universities can take positions against free speech to make some groups feel safe, why not us? Having coddled so many student groups for so long, university administrators found themselves squirming, unable to explain why certain groups, Jews, Asians, don't seem to count in these conversations. Having gone so far down the ideological path, these universities and these presidents could not make the case clearly that at the center of a university is the free expression of ideas, and that while harassment and intimidation would not be tolerated, offensive speech would and should be protected. As CNN's Van Jones has eloquently said, the point of college is to keep you physically safe, but intellectually unsafe to force you to confront ideas that you vehemently disagree with. What we saw in the House hearing this week was the inevitable result of decades of the politicization of universities. America's top colleges are no longer seen as bastions of excellence, but partisan outfits, which means they will keep getting buffeted by these political storms as they emerge. They should abandon this long misadventure into politics retrain their gaze on their core strengths and rebuild their reputations as centers of research and learning. Yep, there you go. And I, I think that was great. Whoever was responsible for writing that, I don't know if he writes his own stuff. Or I, I, I believe they have a, a wide swath of, of writers who help them do this. But that was that was fantastic. And I think clearly outlined the situation that we have going on. Mind you, like the baked into the foundation of America is not this idea that we are supposed to protect the majority, which on college campuses would be left-leaning uh, views, principles, and ideology. It is to protect the minority. So this is not what's happening in, in, in the case of, of this, because you're not allowing the minority to be able to speak freely. Like we said, uh, microaggressions and hate speech, all these things that I disagree with, uh, you know, uh, fundamentally, are totally okay when used against white students, when used against Jewish students, which, which when used against anybody who is deemed to be, you know, the oppressor in the case, in, in whatever situation you're analyzing, never okay in, in the other direction. So that's an interesting thing. And what I posit is the solution to this is to just allow everybody to say what they're thinking and feeling so long as they are not inciting violence or calling for violence against uh, another group of students or any particular student. Seems like a pretty easy solution. Yeah, uh, it does. It does. Uh, how close do you think we are, Amala, to 
this being an actual breakthrough when it comes to America's universities. You know, in, in my mind, for whatever reason, today is kind of going back to the day that Elon Musk bought Twitter. And, and that was, to me, a real breakthrough because until that point, all of these major big tech owned institutions, all the social platforms were uh, a single hegemony that was in lieu in colluding with the government and they they had one way that you were allowed to talk one set of facts that was the facts and then anything that deviated from around that could be censored etc and it seems like in the university sphere if you have an institution as big and prestigious and historically significant as harvard that all of a sudden could uh, repudiate and renounce this woke ideology and say, well, we're not going to allow our top leadership to institute this stuff anymore. We're not going to have it in our university. Like what a breakthrough that would be. Yeah. And that would really represent to me, you know, a crack in a broken chain link in the chain that is keeping the, our entire university system, uh, under, you know, restricted under this, this, uh, the governance of this woke ideology. So we're, uh, to me, this this just feels like we're so close to, to some kind of breakthrough, similar to what happened with, with Elon Musk and Twitter, uh, but it's also still feels so far away. Yeah, I, I guess what scares me about the conversation, I'm optimistic in that this seems to be a breakthrough to some degree, that people are realizing that at the very least, the rules are, you know, levied out uh, without an even hand. And that's like an important thing to to bring to light and to talk about. What I'm worried about is that your response to this could be, A, we need to allow free speech for all students, and that includes offensive speech. That includes what we've deemed to be hate speech. Or you can have B reaction. Well, we need to strike down on hate speech for left-leaning students, too. And we need to stop them from being able to say bad things about Israel or bad things about white people or bad things about conservatives and be more even-handed in the way that we utilize woke ideology. So... It sounds like a lot of people are saying, well, why why can't I get away with that? Or like, why, why am I not? Why are they not reprimanded for what they do to me? Which is scary because then you can just get it even uh, like heavier hammer brought down on free speech in college when the real solution is we messed up with the hate speech stuff. We messed up with the microaggression stuff. We messed up with the DEI offices and administrators. And we just need to wipe all of that away. I'm reminded of. Yuri Bezmenov, who I cite a lot on this show, uh, was uh, used to work for the KGB in, in Russia, defected from the KGB, and realized that what they were doing was just completely subverting an entire, you know, country and, and generations at a time. And he, his theory is that in order to get rid of the societal rot that you're witnessing right now, it takes an entire generation. So I don't yeah. know. It could be like this is a small step in the realization and we build from here and we move on and generationally this gets better. But I don't see this as like a full force change on behalf of the universities. No, me either. And to the point uh, we talked about a little bit ago with Fareed and, and this coming from CNN, as much as it is, as it is kind of painful to, to hear them say the things that we've been saying on all along and you're not wanting to give credit or whatever, the reality is that I think the people in the middle and the people who are maybe, you know, classical liberals, uh, mm -hmm. people that are in a lot of these mainstream journalist institutions and mainstream celebrities and whatever it may be, people that hold a lot of influence in the culture, they're the, the people that need to be swayed that are yeah. actually going to affect change because it's been their complicity. It's been their silence that has enabled these very woke activists uh, to to occupy all these institutions uh, uh, and all these positions of power within the culture. But if, if you lose CNN and if you start losing the New York times, if you start losing like mainstream celebrities and people like that, then we're talking about, you don't, you're, the, the whole thing's going to collapse like a house of cards when you don't have the the support uh, uh, by, that is baked in. You know, they talk about the silence is violence. Like yeah. it, it almost you can see that where that reasoning comes from, because by not saying anything, you are enabling these radical activists to control literally the entire country and to subvert all of Western civilization, to subvert the entire country. Uh, but that's where this opportunity of lies and why it's a little bit encouraging to see this, even though it does make you wince a little bit, is because, hey, if we can get, we're, we're so close. Every time somebody wakes up and sees the truth and is willing to say it, we're that much closer to no longer being living in a world that's dominated by lies and coercion, but living in a world that's uh, full of free speech and truth. Yeah, it's just uh, the, it's interesting because it sounds 
sort of uh, leftist in the way that we're talking, but it's like there's there's a deep concentration of power in and bureaucracy within these universities. And if you flip that on its head, things would change immediately. Why are we empowering faculty to, you know, come down on students and come down on their free speech instead of empowering students to be able to, you know, point out when a professor is allowing, uh, is making people self-censor or looking for a, a certain... Uh, a, a certain thesis when it comes to these these students writing, which is essentially what they're doing. If you don't agree and toe the line of whatever your professor's ideology is or whatever the, the ideology is of the university, you're not going to do well in school. And it's interesting that during Fareed's talk, he spoke about like the the average in one of their humanity courses is a B or something like that, or, or, or was an A maybe, a B or an A, I forget what he said. But at Yale University, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean that's the average? And it's because students are learning. I just have to say what I have to say and write that on paper and turn it in. And that's how I'll get to the other end of this. So it's going to take a lot to upend a system that that works like that, that has so much money behind it. Fifty point nine billion dollars is insane. And I think people are more concerned about having their status at Harvard than they are about the actual quality of the education that they're receiving at Harvard. If 53% of your students are saying they feel the need to self-censor, where are those students when it's time to speak up? They can't. And uh, I'm, I'm sure they're getting reprimanded or they're scared of, of losing their status on the college campus. And they want to have a life that says, I went to Harvard, not a life that says, I went to Harvard and I actually received a quality education. So that's where we're at now, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like the old adage, you know, you can gain the whole world and lose your soul. And like, I don't want to cast any judgment on people who are in Harvard or anything. Like, you know, my brother-in-law went there and it, it's a great institution that that's very storied. And I'm sure there's ways to navigate your way through it while retaining your principles. But also it's kind of like we talked about with uh, the in female sports and, and Riley Gaines encouraging uh, women to boycott events where transgender athletes are being allowed to uh, to compete. It's like we're in a time where you're going to have to choose between your principles and whether you want to be somebody who's fighting for principles, even if that means an expense to your career, an yeah. expense to your status and an expense to what your, your achievements on paper, so to speak, uh, versus really sticking to your values and advancing them. And that's not fair that life deals you that hand. Uh, I'm reminded of in, in Lord of the Rings, of course, um, when Frodo is talking to Gandalf, Frodo's the ring bearer and he didn't want the ring to pass it to him, but it's now his responsibility to basically save the whole world. And he's like, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. And Gandalf says, so do all who live to see such times, but that's not for them to decide. All that we can do is decide what to do with the time that's given to us. And when you find yourself in a position where you have to, it's not fair that you have to be the one fighting for principles instead of just worrying about your own life and your own right. achievement. But uh, that's not for you to decide. Sometimes life deals you a hand where you need to take a principled stance. And my hope is, you know, our way out of this is for people like Fareed and others to just remember what truth is, what, what truth is like, what the, mm -hmm. what uh, equality is all about, what, uh, you know, fairness and justice and all these things really are outside of this new ideology that's trying to subvert everything and twist everything into knots. And it's really just going back to our roots and, and living out the principles that we all know and love and that are part of part and parcel of, of the culture that we've built and, and live in and, and enjoy. And I really hope that, uh, that we are heading back in that direction and that we'll experience an, an awakening similar to what we did during the civil rights movement, that we appealed back to those first principles. And that's what was our guide out of the the bad ideas that we found ourselves in. So, yep. Stand on your principles, y'all. Stand on your yeah. principles. Stand on business. <laughs> on business. Stand on business. Uh, and we're going to get into super chats on that note big shout out to christopher rufo for dropping yeah. the info on uh, claudine gay and the plagiarism that was happening at harvard university shout outs to good kid productions which i recommend you guys check out their documentary that they did about roland fryer and his academic murder on harvard university and uh, that's titled harvard harvard canceled its best black professor why and it's a mini doc it's only about like 24 minutes um if you are at all interested in that story and about roland fryer's come up and semi downfall you guys can check that out also i think he did a recent interview with coleman hughes uh which oh, no. which is very cool so he is he's he's still around he's still kicking <laughs> i say r.i.p roland but yeah. he's still there r.i.p roland 
<laughs> no, honestly, but that's what I'm talking about. Like his, he sacrificed his career, so to speak, or I mean, I guess it wasn't really chosen, but right. he lost his career, but it was for, for a, a just cause. And I think it, his, his work shines all the brighter because of it. And he'll have a more enduring legacy than he would have if he had just towed the line. Yep. Whenever uh, somebody doesn't do anything wrong and they get in trouble, Taylor and I always go free my man, Roland. He ain't do shit. <laughs> he ain't do shit. hundred <laughs> percent. So, uh, free my man, Roland. He ain't do shit. <laughs> and with that, we'll get into your super chats for the day. Yeah, let's do Celtic it. Celtic blacksmith was our first. He says, Hey Taylor, how was agent Taylor? How was Friday's secret political assassination? I mean, how was the quote unquote wedding? Wink, wink. Wow. You got some, <laughs> some fan. Did We've the Taylor fan theories. club have fanfic now? I guess. Yeah. We got <laughs> some conspiracy theories happening in the chat. Yeah. No, everybody <laughs> missed you. Yeah. I wish it was something that cool. I mean, it was, it was a nice, beautiful wedding. It was my wife's uh, childhood best friend down in Georgia. So, um, or at least that's what I want you to think. <laughs> You're testing the limits of my cover story. Mm -hmm. Jesse C says, finally caught alive. You two are amazing voices of truth and reason in your generation. Twin flames probably mentioned coerced because coerced into transing. What? Oh, I think they're talking about that Netflix show. Twin oh, flames. yeah. I still it's a documentary on the dating. And the, I think the, the dating guru might have like manipulated people into changing genders. Gosh, can y'all, like can I just give y'all a PSA? Never trust somebody who refers to themselves as a guru. Just please, <laughs> just please. I might not always be correct on that assessment, but I think nine times out of 10, I'm going to read, I'm going to lead you in the right direction on that one. If they say guru, just leave them, leave them. <laughs> uh, Sup, my dude says, how dare anyone insult Taylor's pickup lines? Taylor's picked up many an obese, disfigured and mentally ill challenged woman with those lines. What wow. is going on? I don't know what's happening in the chat. See, Taylor, Taylor's not going to want to come back, guys, if you continue to treat him this way. Heck? <laughs> you he stored up all the hate, I guess. For real, y'all um, were angry at him over Friday. I'll tell you the pickup line thing, though. Well, the story behind that that Alex mentioned at, mm -hmm. in his super chat at the beginning of the show. Mm -hmm. um, Alex was telling me something about uh, some some women he'd been asking out and, you know, just the usual red pill discussions of how Typical. girls are just clueless and blah, blah, blah. blah. Oh, wow. And uh, I was like, I got a pickup line for you because he's really into reggaeton. Mm -hmm. And I was, and recently Daddy Yankee retired Daddy and Yankee. decided that he's going to be like a Christian evangelist now. And I was like, you could tell the girls, hey, since Daddy Yankee retired, I'll be your daddy now or something like that. <laughs> and I, I said it because I knew it would make him laugh, which of it did. Course. Um, but well, then funny. he took it seriously. Yeah, okay. Now so now we're getting super chats about it. Line. You're never going to live it down, brother. I guess not. But hey, brother. somebody try that pickup line and let me know how it goes for you. I imagine not well, but go for it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, RP awareness again says I had to send that early super chat because I didn't get to justify what I said on Friday. By the way, Friday was a great show. 10 out of 10. Change your name to Amala Fresh and Fit. <laughs> oh gosh. Thank you. I'm glad that you enjoyed uh, Friday's show. I'm not ever trying to, uh, be a fresh and fit type of podcaster. So I don't know if that's actually a, comp a compliment, <laughs> but I'll take it. Uh, makeup H O R three says, uh, hi, Amal and Taylor. Glad I could catch this live. Sorry for misspelling your name last time. LOL. Much love from, from Ravenna, Italy. Ooh. Ciao, belli. No worries. Happens all the time. We appreciate you being here for this live. This one was a different one. It was kind of like a deep dive investigation live. Let me know how you guys feel about these. I'm always interested in doing these, although they are kind of hard to pull off when we go, when we post a video every single day. It's kind of hard to do these deeper investigations into things, but uh, let us know if you liked it. Yeah, this one hit a hit a nerve for Amala <clears throat> because you had already known all that stuff about uh, Miss Gay and Roland Fryer Dude. and all this stuff. Yeah, and so, I saw the name know. Claudine Gay and it was like I was like Raven Simone. I had a vision. I was like, I know this girl and I don't like her. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna go in on the story. I'm How like, does it go? I, like, what does she point at her head? Or something? Yeah, something like that. Something like I that. Twitch the eyes. I knew I just had to I had to at least get that story out. Not not often do you get to talk about a, a story like that. So I had to give you all the details. So now you guys can go and bestow that uh, that story upon somebody else. And shout out to you guys for being here and sticking around. We were like, oh, do people care about Harvard and free speech and all this stuff? We, we were like, do we need to do more culturally relevant stuff? But apparently you guys are some, some smart folks who are interested in a discussion about these maybe more highbrow things. Yeah. So shout out to y'all. Glad for, you guys like this one. Yeah. 
Um, or at least we hope you did. Don't, you, you, we see the numbers, but if you right. hated it, don't tell us. <laughs> also, guys, I see you talking. I'm not engaged. I just wear rings on a lot of different fingers. This is just oh. normal. <laughs> This is a normal ring. I always forget notice. that. I don't place too much significant on uh, significance on that particular finger. So I am uh, sorry for the confusion. It's very hipster of you. Yes. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Diva Don says, popping in to say, hey, I'm, I miss seeing you live. I'm on night shift at the moment. Taylor, I will soon be joining you in Tennessee. In January, I start a job with the USDA. What nice. is the first thing I should do? Oh, Ooh. gosh. Well, you have a favorite sports bar, your brother's brewery. That's something he could oh. do first thing. Yeah, I'm glad Omelette was. I was literally thinking what, what that she was asking, what should she do at the USDA? I'm like, <laughs> oh, you need to like invert the food pyramid and, you know, put the meat at the, at the bottom. And, uh, you know, make a make the stinky French kind of cheese mm. legal in the U.S. It's not legal. So our <laughs> friend Andrew Grill told us. I'm like, I got all kind of ideas for that. But yeah, in Tennessee, yeah, check out uh, Big Trouble Brewing. It's in Gallatin, it's northeast of Nashville. Uh, it's my brother's brewery. It's veteran owned by my brother, who's a veteran, mm -hmm. actually still a service member. So anyways, that's a free ad for that. Otherwise, I mean, you got to do Broadway. Everyone does Broadway. Right. It's, it, it's I'll, I'll, I'll still go when new people come to town, but it's not like the locals go a lot. Um, East Nashville is awesome, though. I mean, there's there's plenty, but. Broadway yeah, gets crazy. Around. I'll give you more advice. So many people out there every night. Lots of bachelorette yeah. parties. Tons of bachelorette parties. Tons of way stuff too going many. On. Um, but hey, it's helping the economy, right? It's all about and it. And we just had some tornadoes this past weekend. I was fortunately still driving back from Georgia, um, but there were some tornadoes that touched down in like the Hendersonville area. That's so scary. Really fully destroyed a, a, a church building of a guy I know. And um, a lot of houses and there were unfortunately a few deaths and yeah, it was just like That's brutal. a crazy, um, bit of weather. We were fortunately unharmed, but yeah, a lot of people were texting us and asking if we're okay, and which we are, but, uh, definitely feel for those who were not so fortunate. Yeah. Um, B mad says, I very much relate to Amala being mixed raised by liberal family. I have one question. Do you choose to avoid talking politics or do you have open debate? Um, it depends on who in my family I'm talking to, I guess. Uh, we, we've gotten better. We can like have, we can have pretty open discussions about it. Although there are some issues where we'll just be like, yeah, we're not going to bother because we know that things are going to remain the same. Uh, you know how I feel about it. I know how they feel about it. So we, we'd like to talk about other things. Like I said, outside of this job, I don't spend much time uh, getting too, too back and forth into like politics and, and cultural issues. I feel like this is my outlet for that uh, with you guys. So with family, we talk about other, other stuff. Yes. I love not thinking about social media and trending topics and culture and politics. Yeah, right. <laughs> when, when I'm not doing it for this for the show. It's a lot. Like it's it's enough for like six to eight hours a day to be doing this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Lex says the right has been saying forever that if you allow people to restrict speech, eventually your speech will also be restricted. And now we are seeing just that. Yep. And that's the, beware of the people who are like, you know, we shouldn't, you shouldn't be allowed to say that or that's hate speech or whatever. Cause like who defines that? Who figures, who figures out what, what's hate speech and what's not. And it's going to be the ideology of whoever is in power at the given time. Mm -hmm. Which is why, you know, your, your commitment to speech is tested most when it's people you disagree with who mm -hmm. are speaking and yeah. you need to be passionate about defending their right to speak, not just the people that you agree with. Yep. Uh, RP Awareness again says, Amala, what were you doing this past weekend getting fresh ink late at night? Oh, yeah. I, saw oh, that on yeah. Instagram. I was at were a... you just like YOLO? Do y'all still work out? Get in shape, Kings. Uh, okay, so wait. that's you first. It's a lot of different <laughs> questions. Okay. I was at a super awesome Christmas party uh, that had like a ton of different things going on. It was like this Japanese themed Christmas party that had all these different elements, like an escape room and tattoo artists and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, I'm going to. This is like a once in a lifetime thing. I'm going to get a tattoo at this party. It's kind of covered in uh, tattoo skin right now, but they had flash at this uh, that you could like look through and pick your pick your different tattoos or whatever. And I really liked this little snake one. So your girl has a tattoo on. Uh, I'll be able to take that tattoo skin off in like a day. Uh, but yeah, I was the last one to get it and I got it at like 2 a.m. And it was wow. such a fun party because we were expecting like, oh, maybe... 
maybe the tattoo section of the party is not going to be that that banging like people aren't going to want to do it or whatever but the list of people who wanted to get tattooed was just insane and the artists were incredible and so nice and yeah it was just it's a once in a lifetime type thing so i got it done <laughs> how spontaneous of you that's yeah. crazy wow y'all know i'm no stranger to having tattoos so it's like it, it was it's like, it's like nothing i don't view it in like the highest regard of like you know but i know some people feel some type of way about it i saw i got so many instagram dms like are you turning back into a leftist you're getting tattoos oh. or whatever <laughs> like or this is like anti-religious or something i don't know but it's fine y'all <laughs> y'all at least y'all didn't get tattooed i got it <laughs> it's okay it's gonna I be guess. fine you know, the, the closest I got, we were in Norway and we walked by a, a tattoo place and I was with my, I took like a pilgrimage there a couple of years ago because my mm -hmm. last name is a little village in Norway and we were in a town nearby there. And uh, anyway, I was like, dude, what if we got like tats to commemorate this trip? Like me and my brother, yeah. like a little Viking ship or something. It would have been so badass. But alas, I don't remember if it was closed or if we just like we're like, nah, let's not. But I kind of regret it now. Yeah. I don't want to do a whole other trip. That's how that. I view it. I'm just like, okay, it, it lives in the moment that you got it. Of course, it lives beyond that moment because it's permanent or whatever. But it's just like, yeah. oh, it's it's like a little snapshot that you have that is, you know, just a, a cool memory or whatever. So love that. <laughs> no judgment here. Um, MS says Swift flatbed, flatbed trucker here finally caught live. Love you guys work following since Prager U days. Please cool. do a trucking vid uh, on drivers today versus then. Huh. I don't even know what the what all the different ins and outs of that would be. That's honestly an industry that I know nothing about. Other than that, it's the backbone of America. That's what everybody says about trucking. That's all. Yeah, isn't it like one of the <laughs> most like most prevalent jobs in the US? I think so. Is truck driving. It'd be interesting to do like a vlog and like do a day in the life with a trucker. Yeah, or like a, like what if all trucks in America stopped running? Like how would that affect the United States? I imagine it would be just insane. Yeah, insane. I mean, didn't we kind of see that with the the boycott they did in Canada? They that yeah. was kind of part of the point they were trying to prove. Yeah. But yeah, salt to the earth. My um I step on what is what is an uncle that's like my my aunt was divorced and remarried. What does that make him? Oh, step on gosh, uncle, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I guess it's just my uncle, but yeah. he, uh, he's a truck driver. So and my, my aunt used to drive the like oversized small pickup trucks in front of like the oversized big trucks. Ah, so gotcha. Anyways, salt to the earth. That's America for you. That I seems like it. a hard career. Thank you. Not gonna lie. Yeah. No, no kidding. No you see a lot though. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a really popular like old guy who's a trucker uh, and he makes TikToks. Have you seen him? And he just like this no. Southern dude, really thick accent, but like old and just kind of like interacts with Gen Z and they ask him all these questions about his job and he just like shows him stuff and gives him life advice. It's like super wholesome. Yeah. Uh, as much I as I don't like TikTok, TikTok I love TikTok. There's like such a variety of like individuals that you would just never expect to be on there who you just learn. You learn a lot for real. I yeah. Mean, yeah, you can. <laughs> despite you can the brain rot. Yeah. Melt your brain. But right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Charles says, "This here's ten dollars to go towards Taylor's webcam fund. Here's hoping that one day his image will be as crisp and beautiful as yours." I'm <laughs> oh, no. we, we lose need... a little because of the because yeah. uh, of it. I'm, I'm actually connected through Zoom. Yes. Uh, so the and quality. So, and there's a variety of factors to like the resolution has to go through my camera to the capture device here, then through the internet, and then through the streaming platform so there's a lot of ways it can go wrong and unfortunately it just it's not going to look as good as as Amala's. i think there's maybe ways we can make marginal improvements but we will put um, that ten dollars towards those marginal yes. improvements <laughs> so but i i apologize for my graininess i've seen a lot of your uh <laughs> your comments about that but mm -hmm. alas we're, we're a two-person team we're doing what we can guys we are independent <laughs> we're trying <laughs> You may see me in more clarity because I will be in person in Los Angeles this week. If we can figure out a little corner of the studio yeah. for me to have a little camera shot in. It's a pretty small space. There we're in is there, like so. a two foot by two foot corner that's right over here that Taylor may or may not be able to <laughs> squeeze into. And that is just about the only room he has. So <laughs> we're going to so try we'll to have Taylor on the show in person. Uh, and uh, we'll... <laughs> Gonna figure so it out. please become a patron so we can afford a larger space <laughs> to have go. guests and uh, have an extra spot for when producers come to town. Yeah, Patreon's <laughs> down below, guys. In addition to not getting ad reads. That um, is true. 
But before I tell you about that, let me tell you about Helix Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just kidding. Mustika BM says, hi from Finland. I've been following you for some time now. And even though I may sometimes disagree, I still keep coming back and enjoy the show very much. Yay. Love, love that. We love we love our Finns who, who watch the show. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Love the fins, and we're glad that you don't always agree. That's yes. a healthy sign. That's the standard. Don't always agree with me, guys. Yeah, it's <laughs> Unless you, you just so agree. happen to, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Giannini says, hello, Amala. Finally watching you live. Hello from the Philippines. Wow. Oh, Finland, awesome. Philippines. It's like um, Italy. sides of the world. Yeah, we've had all over yeah. the place. Love it. Thank you for watching. Most Pavel of Dog says, do you know the journalist Jesse Single? He's part of the anti-woke left and gets constantly dogpiled for his well-researched articles on issues with youth gender transition. He's a really nice and sincere guy. No, I'll have to look him up. I'm always interested in I've seen in him on Twitter a lot. Okay, maybe, I, I, I'm, good maybe if I saw his handle, I would recognize it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we appreciate mm-hmm. voices like that. We really do. Uh, for really sure. do. Hiccups. Dawn Demanda Ooh. says, did you know Daily Wire Plus reported today that gay is under fire for plagiarism? She's a serious problem. Harvard is no longer a serious school. Yeah, we were Maybe just was before you that. talked to, talked about that on yeah, the show today. Yeah, yeah, with Chris Rufo. He's the one who, and and what, what was his other, the other guy's name? Sorry, I didn't mention his partner. Somewhere mm-hmm. in here. Uh, Chris Brunet. So, yeah, so shout That's out cool. to them for finding that stuff. You have to read through that woman's thesis, which I imagine was just ugh, yeah. <laughs> difficult. <laughs> labor some of these people do yeah uh you were real one the real julia one. prezo says miriam webster uprising comma rebellion arabic intifada literally the act of shaking off we have to be careful in what is defined as inciting violence isn't all clear to me this was i completely agree with you that's why i don't agree that the, you you should be able to reprimand students for saying things like from the river to the sea and, and things like that because that is not inherently a, a call for genocide unless a student says i want to kill blank group of people or genocide group of people you have to have very distinct proof of there being uh, something like that said. And from the river to the sea is not a distinctly genocidal term to say, uh, neither is is what you've just defined. So it's very difficult, which is why you should just allow free speech for all. Yes. Uh, Heather McDonald had a good definition on her city journal articles. She said speech should be protected unless it crosses the line into direct threats to individuals or incitement to imminent violence. And I think those qualifiers are important because even, you know, hate speech calls to genocide, et cetera, as long as they're not necessarily imminent or direct threats, like that's still Still protected protected. under the first amendment. Um, And if you're, I'd rather have university policies be be, uh, modeled after the first amendment protections than some arbitrary code of conduct that becomes highly subjective and then oh if we suddenly decide this is bullying well misgendering is bullying as well and now we're just into again selectively um censoring people uh, for on ideological basis so percent no but that doesn't mean you agree with speech and i also think like i mean not to go back into this but there is a place as a leader in an institution for providing moral clarity for uh, condemning certain statements or, mm-hmm. you know, elaborating on, Hey, if you, if this is what you mean, when you say this, then I condemn that, you know, but that's different from saying you're not allowed to speak. And yep. that should always be the very, very last uh, resort. Yep. Mo. Okay. Hi Q says without liberals, leftists would not exist. That's just quoting that. I know you like to differentiate between the two, but I'm sorry. You liberals must take responsibility for creating this culture. I don't know. It's it's arguable. There's a lot of things you could argue in that. You could argue that like leftists are just uh, the the pendulum swing from conservatives. So without conservatives, leftists wouldn't exist. There's like a ton of ton of things you could say there, uh, which uh, to me it seems like in large part leftism is the complete abandonment of liberal principles. So it's hard as a hard argument to to substantiate in my in my opinion, and, and that's why I think there should be a clear distinction because you know. Uh, a lot of the people who are echoing echoing the sentiments that we've shared on this show are classic liberals, and we invite them and would like they're welcome to be a part of whatever club it is that we're we're in right now because uh, that that sort of shared uh, principle is really important. Mm-hmm. And it's going to take a coalition of people who you may not agree with on all the finer points. Yeah, it's going to take a coalition of them to you know rest the 
control of society back from the radical uh, leftist types. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kate Svensson says the Jewish students should demand refunds on their tuition since they are currently unable to receive the education they've paid for. Yeah, I don't know how this is working in terms of how classes are running and things like that. I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure if if it's hindering their classes and, you know, they're not being able to go to school, then I would imagine that would be affecting more than just Jewish students. And that would be a reimbursement on the case of anybody who's missing a class. I don't think there should be distinct protections because a Jewish student is uncomfortable with Palestinian protests happening on campus and that they deserve a reimbursement for, for that. Just in the same way that, you know, if there was any other protest that was occurring uh, against any other group or ideology, I don't think those students deserve reimbursement. So it's just all about the finer details. If they're missing classes, then yeah. Uh, pay him back. And one more on similar lines. Julia Prezo says, you don't see an answer to this to be the addition of Jewish students to the DEI protections rather than an overall lessening slash correction of the kind of, of quote unquote protections that limit speech, do you? Yeah, that's exactly the way I view it. I think what you should do is say that we were wrong fundamentally with DEI in the first place and that and that should have never happened because now you're in this game of, you know, white students raising their hand and saying, why is it that I get in trouble for a microaggression, but they're not in trouble when they use a microaggression against me? What about when they call me a white supremacist or a whitey or whatever, you know, ism or slur people are using right now? And the same thing with Jewish students. Why do I get in trouble uh, for committing an act of a, a microaggression or what you've deemed to be hate speech, but they don't get in trouble for saying from the river to the sea. When the real question is, why were you ever getting in trouble in the first place for things like microaggressions and hate speech? Because these things cannot be clearly defined and should be protected under free speech. So yeah, I don't, I don't advocate for the inclusion of Jewish students into, you know, like the diversity equity program. I think the whole thing needs to be disbanded. Yeah. And this is, again, why, you know, they're on the ropes in this fight whenever they find themselves as a last resort appealing to the constitutional protections and the constitutional standard of speech whenever mm -hmm. they're backed into a corner. Uh, and that's where you have to continue to press them and hold the standard. Well, OK, so now we believe in the constitutional standard. Then yep. what about this, this and this? You haven't upheld that. And if we're going to use that as a standard now, you're done so. And this whole thing has been a sham. Um, so they can't just pay lip service to the constitutional standards uh, if they have a body of evidence that, to attest to the fact that they have never abided by them and that all the policies and all of the energy that they've brought into the institutions since they've uh, been in the position of power that they're in has been in express opposite, expressly uh, to the opposite of the constitutional standards. Yeah. So that's where I was saying we're, we're so close that you can either back to the corner, they're flailing and you got to like just land that knockout punch and just get rid of this. Not physically, of course, but, mm -hmm. but get rid of this uh, DEI stuff because it, it's on the ropes. It's for at least it feels that way. Uh, okay. Reddit sex defender says, since we talk about professors and doctors, I recommend everyone look into Dr. Vincent Harenam's work. He is a data scientist and a geek. Okay. Dr. Who? Heron, Heronams? Huh. Vincent Harenams. Okay. We'll, we'll take I'll a look-see. Hopefully it's nothing weird. Yeah, for real. <laughs> uh, RP Awareness says, Taylor, you know you're my bro, but I just noticed that there's a lot of gray hair in that stubble. I gave Amala a break even to, I, I gave Amala a break to even out the criticism. By the way, the 1975 band sucks. Amala, LOL, great show, as always, guys. <laughs> what is going so on? Much I don't know what's going on in that. I think he's keeping chat. tabs on how much he's uh, teasing each of us. Sure, and yeah. Keeping it even in also, his own mind. Also, you should let your gray hair grow for anybody who's listening right now. That is the natural process of being a human being, and you should allow that to take place. I'm proud of it, man. Instead I'm of falling for this. Gandalf. It's hard for me to differentiate if it's gray or blonde because I've always had kind of like a mix of like, you know, blonde and, right. and like light brown beard, right. which does not look good. So I keep it stubble, but I'll take the gray. Sign As you should. <laughs> Caitlin Buttonart says, I went straight into full-time work after graduating and worked my way up. I have now bought a house and a car at 22. College Ooh. is not always needed to succeed. Girl, congratulations. Round of applause for that. That's dope. What the heck? 22. Well That's amazing. All right, a few more. I have to catch a flight, so I'm going to 
kind of maybe go through these pretty quickly. Yep. Uh, Chloe, uh, Judah Wanismus just sends a super chat, no message. Thank you, Judah. Oh, here it is. Mm. Forgot to add a message. I am a trumpeter from Kenya studying in Prague. Really enjoy listening to you guys. Wow. That's so cool. Wow. That is awesome. Another congratulations. Wow. That's awesome. My brother was in Budapest and Prague uh, this week, and I think now he's stuck in Amsterdam because of weather, but I'm really jealous of his trip. And yeah. he was in Vienna, too. So just like three beautiful cities. I'm super jealous. And I bet the music scene uh, out there is crazy for what you're doing. Very cool. Totally. They went to like Christmas markets and stuff. Just looks so awesome. Um, Cyber Bacon says, hey, Amala, I saw The Boy and the Heron subtitled and loved it. I go back to... Uh, Maro to watch the dub. Would love to know your thoughts on the movie. I haven't watched it yet. I was going to go and watch it uh, when it had first came to theaters here in LA, but I haven't had the time to go yet. So no spoilers, guys. I haven't seen the film yet. <laughs> I think I'm going to watch the dub first and then uh, then the sub later down the line when it, when it comes out later. Uh, I'm very curious because everybody's talking about Robert Pattinson's performance as a voice actor in it. So I'm just so curious to hear his voice. Mm. I've seen snipp snippets of it and it's just insane. I don't know how he's doing it, but uh, yeah, I'm very excited to see the film. This is the guy you like, the Jaime Miyazaki. Hi, Miyazaki. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be good. I just know cool, it. Cool. I just know it. I'm all the nerds out over those in Hunger, Hunger Games. Yes, it is very true. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk your uh, ear off. Uh, but we don't have time for that now. So, no, Chloe, don't. Brian, happy Monday. I work when you guys go live, so I always join late, but I love to go back and watch your show. Stay awesome. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for going back and watching. We hope you appreciate and love the show today. Thank you. Jennifer Abrams says, hi, guys. I listen to you while I work. Finally caught alive while digging holes with my brother. I'm a plumber. Love you guys. Keep up being great. Okay. Digging holes. We've got a regular Shia LaBeouf over here. <laughs> that sounds also very difficult. Shout out to you. That's hilarious. Uh, Fulcrum says, what do you think of Destiny's Divorce, Amala? I didn't. Oh, I don't give it much, which is so interesting. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. I think I'm allowed to say this. So I'd like... Uh, I read the news about it earlier the, uh, in the week, and then Saturday I was filming a video for Jubilee, and Destiny was there, so we ran into each other, and like we, oh, we cool. talked for a little bit, but they don't allow the people who are part of the video to talk before you film, so we just got to really uh, go back. Was he on the same video as you, or filming something else? Same video, same video. Oh, cool. So we'll be in the same video. I, I wasn't too happy with like the the filming, uh, just because I didn't really like the prompts for this video, and I felt like everybody continuously got off prompt and it was getting way more political rather than like a cultural slash philosophical discussion. So we'll mm. see when it comes out, how it's, how it's edited. Um, but yeah, it was fun. I, I, and I did not think about, uh, destiny and his divorce. I think that's a very difficult thing to go through for any human being. So, uh, my, my thoughts go out to him and I hope, uh, that he's handling it well. I mean, I saw him at that shoot on Saturday. So I, at the very least, he's like a workhorse and he's putting his head into work. So I hope and wish the very best for him. Well said. Um, Koba Maniac says, hi guys, just wanted to say thanks for such a great show. I love to listen while I deliver mail on my route. You guys are great. Enjoy cool. your Monday. Oh, thank you. That's very cool. <laughs> Uh, Celtic Blacksmith says on Friday's live, there were a few of us making up random excuses for Taylor's absence in the chat. Hence the secret agent joke. Totally gotcha. a joke. No, totally a joke. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't watch the chat while this. like normally I'm able to watch the chat while we're going as you know, Taylor's talking or as things are happening, <laughs> but I couldn't watch the chat. So I'm sure some crazy stuff is going down <laughs> while, while oh. I was just rattling off to you guys. I was just yapping all day Friday. Mm -hmm. And handling all the buttons and switches and everything. <laughs> oh so I'm always over here in like a spaceship controls. Yeah. And Barely talking, pulled it off. Plates. Alas. Um, Kate Graham says, what do you guys think about the use of the word indoctrination? I'm writing an essay for my college composition final. Oh. Love your takes, Amala. I think it has uh, like a negative connotation. I don't think it's always necessarily a negative term. I think we're all indoctrinated in some way, shape or form. So I guess that would be my short answer to that. Uh, RP Wenis says, I didn't want to out your pickup lines, Taylor, but I almost died laughing hearing you say it out loud. By the way, destroy the thoughtery Amala fresh and fit. Take what Amala fresh and fit. Take notes, women. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you need to get, you need to make your own channel to get these thoughts out, Alex. <laughs> really? <laughs> your own 304 channel. Then the 304s to the streets, mm -hmm. as he says. <laughs> Somebody says, I was just kidding about the pickup line, Taylor, though. I heard now everyone's being nice again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thought I heard you 
Use that line, though I heard you use that line on Blossom, hence her foul mood during the Buck Angel debate. Oh my gosh, yeah, I, I, what a world that was. Some In some parallel universe, that's an insane parallel universe or something like that. <laughs> what happened? Oh my gosh. What a what a crazy day that was, man. Yes, it was. The the looks that we got from the our our fellow staff members uh as we yep. walked through the building and to the studio. It's a fascinating day indeed. Oh lordy. Uh Jesse C says PS coming to you from British Columbia, Canada, and poutine Beautiful. is delicious. I want one now. Also wish the conservative gays had been more eloquent and gifted debaters. Uh, I guess that was in reference to our one of our prior episodes. Episode? Yeah, I don't remember which episode that. I think it was like conservative versus liberal. Oh yes, reaction. that one, the the one that was mainly about religion and stuff, which you should have been there for because oh my gosh, it was that a religious episode? Um, uh, what was I saying? Poutine. The only thing I'm worried about is texture, y'all. So, it look, it's giving soggy, uh, and I don't know if I can handle that. The texture which they girl. claim it doesn't happen, but right. I mean, they keep it crispy, so I believe it. I believe it. If it's more like cheese curds than cheese, then maybe that's more like you know solid and not all melty and gooey. But I hate the anyway. sog so much. I'll literally order burgers with the bun on the side so that the bun does not get soggy somewhere in between the burger being made and handed to me. I can't deal okay. with. Well, <laughs> I cannot deal with the texture of it. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like give me the cheese and on the side. Yeah. I'll dip the front the, the <laughs> potatoes in there. I can't do it. Uh, Celtic Blacksmith, I think this is our last one. Says Amla, you're gonna put Taylor in the corner? Nobody puts Taylor in the corner. Showing my age, but name that movie. It's, I don't know the movie. Uh, if it's a movie reference. It did it? spark something in my mind where I'm like, that sounds awfully familiar, but I have no idea where it's from. Okay, I'm you don't so have to super chat again, but let us know in the chat. Yeah, Someone let us know if you recognize dancing. that. Dirty Dancing. I've never watched that movie. Nobody puts baby in the corner. Ah, but I do. I actually Where have I heard that from? I don't remember. I Googled it. It was cited somewhere else. Yeah, people are saying Dirty Dancing. Okay, yeah, I've never seen that okay. movie. Okay. Although... And one more came in from Just, J-U-S-T-E. Just. Uh, I love you guys. Look up to Amala and her views on life. Keep going. Thank you, girl or guy. I don't want to misgender awesome. you. That's a critical offense these days thank you so much for that super chat we really appreciate you and i'm glad that my views are resonating with you guys and with that taylor's got to get on a plane to come here to la so that you guys can have him on the show hopefully on wednesday if we can figure that out with all the technical uh, difficulties that mm -hmm. that entails but uh we're gonna get that done guys thank you so much for watching Please like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we're live. That's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Plus, we post videos for you guys every single day. Tomorrow's video is about a mom going viral for twerking on some random dude at a party and her son trying to stop it. And he's 10 years old and it's just devastating and tragic and horrible. And I hate the Internet sometimes, guys. That'll be out tomorrow. You guys can check it out. <laughs> if you like this video, like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified. And we will see you next time. Bye guys. Nice.